Great. Sounds good. All right, you're all set, Jeff? Sure. Great. So um, thank you all for coming. I think it's a, it's a kind of a fun day here and I'm, I'm honored to introduce Jeff, um, Jeff Moore, uh, who is in the Cell and Developmental Biology Program or department here at Anschutz. And Jeff got his real start or at least his graduate start at the University of Rochester um, in New York, uh, where he worked with Rita Miller um, studying kind of the mechanics of spindle positioning um, in budding yeast. And it really honed his kind of expertise and love for microtubule biology. He, he then took that and kind of wanted to propel that into microtubule motor proteins and studying dynein activity and, and much the same process of spindle positioning, but also really getting deeper into the mechanics where he did some very creative experiments at WashU with John Cooper. And I think some of the ones that really are ex most exciting to me were experiments where he was using things like lasers to, to blast holes in, in microtubules. And I think what that really highlights is, is Jeff's creative nature um, in, in studying this, what I believe to be a fundamental problem in microtubule biology. And that's really understanding how they mechanically organize cells. Um, Jeff has since been at, uh, moved from John Cooper's lab, um, then moved on to um, here at Anschutz, where he's been since 2012 or 2013. Um, and, uh, and he has now uh, risen to associate professor and, and is also the director of the cell, stem cells and development program, a graduate program. And he's been really a leader in that program in a very short period of time. So I think it's fantastic to, to have that. And I'll just finish with just, you know, one, one thing that I think is again, really nice about uh, Jeff's science is just the, um, the bridging of really fundamental questions to really understanding um, kind of broad big picture questions in, in the organization of microtubules and in, in driving um, everything from neuronal activity to spindle positioning. And, and now we're gonna learn a little bit more in terms of uh, targeting microtubules um, for therapeutic potent potential as well. So I'll turn it over to Jeff from there and I'm looking forward to the talk, Jeff. Thanks, Chad. Uh, yeah, you know, actually to get started, uh, just I just want to emphasize a couple of things that that Chad touched on in his introduction um, that were that are important for me and uh, maybe for for any trainees on the call. You know, I, I was I was really brought up as a basic cell biologist, and really that's kind of the lens that I um, look through still. But when I was a postdoc at WashU, um, I had the opportunity to to begin collaborations with a number of um, of, of researchers who are really interested in more disease focused and translational problems, and particularly cancer. And I was on a molecular oncology T32 um, as a for a couple of years as a postdoc, um, and that was really impactful for me and an opportunity to really learn from clinician scientists and think about how the kinds of questions that I'm still really interested in um, to this day. Um, have important implications in, in human health and, and disease treatment. So um, that's really going to be the, um, the spirit of this talk today is really thinking about fundamental cell and molecular biology and how that um, impacts and informs our understanding of cancer and cancer treatment. Um, I am going to show you some slides. And uh, what I would prefer, I don't want to watch the chat while I'm talking. So so really, if you have any questions or want to interrupt with any points, I really invite you to do so. Um, I think that'd be, that'd be great. Okay, so let's start with this. Okay. Are you seeing the right view? No. I think we see presenter view, Jeff. Let's try to switch this up. How about now? There you go. All right, great. Okay. So, all right. So, 
every cell in your body has an engine of microtubule dynamics running in it. And that's really kind of nicely illustrated by this image of dynamic microtubules in a migrating cell. So cells are harnessing the output of this engine of microtubule dynamics for a wide variety of processes. Um, famously in migrating cells, they use microtubule dynamics to drive the protrusion of membrane for crawling forward as well as moving and pulling along organelles as the cell migrates. But in other contexts, microtubules are used to generate signaling structures or these, these um, fluid moving structures like cilia and flagella, which are used to move fluids or to act as signaling antenna. But perhaps the oldest and most famous role of microtubules in cells is in the mitotic spindle, where these microtubule filaments that were um, identified under the microscope, you know, over a century ago, are famously arrayed into these bipolar configurations where one side of the, the end of this, the filaments are focused into these spindle poles and the other sides emanate out towards the chromosomes that they grab hold of, align at the center of the metaphase plate, and then during anaphase pull towards the poles. And that's a necessary requirement in all of the cells in your body to faithfully divide and partition uh, the genome during cell division. So you get the sense of looking at these different examples that microtubules are really involved in a wide variety of cellular processes. But I think you can also think about this in, in sort of a developmental context, which is gonna be a theme that, that runs through this talk that when cells have different requirements for protrusion and migration or signaling or fundamental properties like cell division, they'll reconfigure these cytoskeletal networks to, to support those different functions. And so my lab is really interested in this broad question of, of understanding the molecular regulation of microtubule networks and how cells build networks at the right time, tune them for different types of processes, and then destroy them when they need to um, change gears and, and move on to a different kind of process. And we're really, are really interested in understanding how this regulation impacts cellular function, uh, how it uh, plays out in different developmental contexts, and then how it goes awry in different disease contexts. As cancer biologists, you should all care about tubulin because it really touches on many different aspects of cancer cell biology, right? So famously, it's important in the mitotic spindle, so it's important for genome instability and mutation, but it really touches on many of these different hallmarks of cancer. And today, what I really wanna focus on is, is talking about a deep understanding of the basic mechanism of microtubule dynamics, and then understanding how that mechanism is targeted famously by microtubule targeting agents that are used in the clinic and trying to develop a better understanding of the relationship between this mechanism and these drugs as a way of really going forward, predicting response to, to these chemotherapeutics and also perhaps developing new therapies that can more effectively um, target different types of microtubule networks in different cells. Okay. So these are the learning objectives. I had a, I had a third one in here about the spindle mid zone, but um, I, I, I had to, I had to cut some things for time because I, I have this um, uh, ambition to tell you about everything that we're working on in the lab, but it's it uh, would make for kind of a long afternoon. So uh, we're going to focus on these two. And the way I'd like to think about it is sort of the major questions that we're interested in, in the lab. And those are, um, you know, how tubulin expression, the expression of the genes and the proteins that encode tubulin subunits that are the building blocks of microtubules determine sensitivity to microtubule targeting agents, and then understanding how microtubule targeting agents alter this basic mechanism on microtubule dynamics or, or shift the equilibrium and how that gives rise to defects in cellular processes like mitotic spindle formation. Okay, so let's start with the basics. So if we're going to talk about uh, microtubules for the next 50 minutes, I need to tell you some fundamental information about how microtubules work in cells. So the basic building block or the brick of that forms microtubules is this dimeric protein known as tubulin. 
So tupioin is an ancient protein. It's conserved across eukaryotic evolution, and it has ancestors in prokaryotes that are actually monomeric GTPases. So in eukaryotes, tubulin is an obligate heterodimer. So it has an alpha and a beta subunit that are encoded by, encoded by distinct genes. And both of them, alpha and beta, are GTP binding proteins. But importantly, only the beta subunit can hydrolyze its GTP, or only, I should say, only this GTP that's bound here on the end of the beta subunit is hydrolyzed and exchanged. And that hydrolysis has a really important role in determining the assembly activity of tubulin and driving the mechanism of microtubular dynamics. So let's zoom out and think about this in, in terms of a, of a polymer. So the GTP bound tubulin, and that's tubulin that has GTP at both of those sites, has a high level of assembly activity. So this is the fundamental um, highly conserved activity of tubulin that's really driven its conservation um, across eukaryotic evolution is that it's a protein that likes to bind to itself, okay? That's why it's a really effective uh, brick for building polymers. And when it's in its GTP bound form, tubulin likes to bind to other tubulins, but it does it in a very characteristic way. So if you think about this free tubulin dimer here, when it's GTP bound, it'll land on the end of this linear chain of other tubulin heterodimers and form a longitudinal bond here. And then it's, it's doing this alongside these other chains, these linear chains called protofilaments that in addition to having longitudinal bonds that are, that are important for stacking up the tubulins in that chain, it also forms lateral bonds on the side with neighbors. So the current model for microtubule dynamics is that when GTP tubulin lands on the end of this protofilament, that protofilament is growing longer, but it's also going to zipper up by binding to its neighbors. And in zippering up, these, protofilaments, these protofilaments form a two-dimensional lattice. But that lattice has a natural curvature at the protofilament-protofilament interface, so that closing the lattice is actually closing a cylinder. So the inside of this microtubule is hollow, and then the outside is the surface upon which a number of different microtubule motor proteins like dynines and kinesins, as well as a host of microtubule binding proteins bind on the outside, okay? So this is how a tubulin dimer forms a microtubule polymer, but the polymer itself has really interesting dynamic properties, and that's based on the nucleotide state of the tubulin. So as I mentioned, when tubulin's GTP bound, it has high assembly activity, but once this subunit is buried, within the microtubule by you know, subsequent tubulin dimers assembling on the end, that stimulates hydrolysis of this nucleotide. And hydrolysis and subsequent uh, phosphate release destabilize interactions with neighboring tubulins. Now, as long as there's a sufficient supply of incoming GTP tubulin to keep this assembly going and keep burying the GTP tubulin down in the lattice, this microtubule will keep growing. But if hydrolyzed tubulin is close to the end and there's not a sufficient supply to keep building more microtubule, the microtubule end will become very unstable because the GDP bound tubulin now can escape this sort of prison of all of its tubulin neighbors and peel out from the microtubule polymer. That transition from a stable growing microtubule to a depolymerizing microtubule is known as catastrophe. And once that microtubule undergoes catastrophe, now GDP tubulin can escape the polymer and go back into solution. And once it's in solution, it can exchange its nucleotide through a process that's not very well understood and be recharged with a new GTP and, and undergo the whole cycle again. So that's, that's the basics. There's also an additional step, which is still kind of mysterious called rescue. And that's when a microtubule that has undergone catastrophe and is depolymerizing can transition back to a growing state. If there's enough GTP tubulins that, that land on the end of that depolymerizing microtubule, at some rate, it can restore it to a stable growing state, okay? The, the cool thing about this to me is that this whole complicated process, which involves a GTPase and its nucleotide binding state, but also these sort of quorum activities of how the tubulin is interacting with its neighbor. That's a 
intrinsic property of the tubulin protein itself. So all you need to drive this cycle of microtubule dynamics is tubulin protein, a sufficient supply of it, and GTP. And that's, uh, that's demonstrated here in an experiment from my lab where we've taken purified tubulin that we've purified from, from pig brains, which is a great source for tubulin protein. We've got it 5.6 micromolar. We're giving it a, a warm buffer bath and a sufficient supply of GTP. And what you can see is when we add green labeled free tubulin and image it on a turf microscope, we tack down a stabilized fragment of a microtubule that's labeled in red here to a cover slip. We can watch the assembly of the free floating green labeled GTP tubulin onto the end of the microtubule. And what you can see is that these form these um, green filaments that grow and transition to shortening, and then they just apparently disappear. It's because once they undergo that catastrophe transition, then the depolymerization is very rapid and they'll depolymerize all the way back down to the red labeled stabilized portion of the microtubule. So all you need to drive this is a sufficient supply of free tubule and, and GTP, and you can undergo these cycles of growth and shortening. So you can, you can rebuild this in vitro, but this is also the basic reaction that's going on in cells and it's underlying a number of those processes that I, that I showed you on, a, on the earlier slide. Okay, so for us, this is a really fun uh, uh, area of study because you know it's based in this, this biochemical reaction that we can measure and reconstitute in vitro, but then we can also examine how changes in the reaction impact a number of different biological processes in cells and development and in human disease. And you know we're really interested in um, how the basic mechanism of microtubule dynamics impacts cancer cells because it's well established that there's a relationship between tubulin activity and cancer progression uh, and aggression. So uh, this is this happens at you know really fundamental observations like increased assembly rates are uh, correlated with uh, chromosomal instability in cancer lines, as well as the well-established principle that microtubules are a prominent drug target for chemotherapeutics, right? And this is just one example of a taxol, which is a well-established um, microtubule targeting agent. It turns out there are many, many different microtubule targeting agents that impact distinct steps of this uh, microtubule dynamics cycle. So there are famous depolymer, depolymerizers like colchicine and vinblastin and the cortisol that impact the activity of GTP tubulin, or when GTP tubulin lands on the end of the microtubule, blocks its interaction with more GTP tubulin, right? So basically caps the end of the microtubule. Uh, or there are stabilizing drugs that I'm showing here in green that promote microtubule stability by preventing catastrophe. So basically stabilizing tubulin in its polymer state um, after it assembles into a microtubulin. And these are really uh, potentially useful tools in cell biology for studying microtubule activity, but also in the clinic. And I really wanted to focus in our, in, in our time today on the most famous of these, which is Taxol, which is also known as, as Pacotaxol. And I wanna talk a little bit here about the history of Taxol because I think it's really, um, it's really kind of interesting. Uh, so, so Taxol is a, is a famous chemotherapeutic these days, and it's a, it's a frontline chemotherapeutic used in, in treating breast and ovarian cancer and a number of different cancers. Um, but it has a really interesting history. So Taxol is a naturally derived compound. It was identified in starting back in the 60s when the National Cancer Institute partnered with the USDA to go out and identify plant-derived compounds that could be effective anti-cancer um, treatments. So in the early 60s, I think it was actually 1962, um, Arthur Barclay, who was a botanist with USDA, went on this really ambitious uh, field project to collect samples from a number of different plants. Um, and actually the very last one on his multi-year um, multi project the, the 1,654th 
species that he collected from was the Pacific yew tree um, that, that was, in this case, um, near Mount St. Helens. So Barclay collected a sample of, of bark, stem, berry, and leaf from the yew tree uh, and brought it back to the lab along with the other um, 1,653 um, species that he sampled from. So the yew tree, there wasn't any particular reason that, that Barclay uh, sampled from the yew tree, although the yew tree is, is pretty famous historically because it's been known to be poisonous for thousands of years, right? Uh, in, in the case of this effort with, with NCI and the USDA, the, the compound derived from the yew tree ended up being the only compound that made it to the clinic, right? So this whole ambitious project, Taxol, to my knowledge, is the only one that actually made it to the clinic and is used today. And it has sort of a long and interesting history from here too. So after it was brought back to the lab, uh, Taxol was, or, or sorry, I should say, the extract from Taxus brevifolia was shown to be effective at inhibiting cell, cell proliferation. Uh, the active ingredient was, uh, was purified and named Taxol based on Taxus brevifolia. And then in 1971, the structure was published. So this in itself is a pretty, uh, pretty important event because this is a real challenge. I mean, for one thing, it's a very complex structure. It's extremely hydrophobic and it's only present in small quantities from the bark of this very, very slow growing tree. Okay, so it seems like a promising drug, but it's already very difficult to work with. In the late 70s, um, importantly, Susan Horowitz started working with Taxol and she showed within a first couple of years of, of doing experiments with it, that it had a very specific and novel effect. So when I showed you MTAs a few slides ago, Nicotazol, uh, then Blastin, Colchicine, those were already established and known depolymerizers as microtubules, but Taxol had a very different effect. Taxol stabilized microtubules. And the Horwitz lab showed this in vitro with purified tubulin as well as in cells, such as this HeLa cell treated with a rather high dose of Taxol on the electron microscope. They could see it formed these dense bundles of microtubules, right? So this gave a hint of a potentially new mechanism of action um, that there was this drug, Taxol, that could inhibit cell proliferation, perhaps by stabilizing microtubules, okay? And this really like opened up a new field for understanding how Taxol worked and how the regulation of microtubule stability was really important for cell proliferation. But a couple more notes on the, on the history of Taxol, right? So, so, so that's great and exciting uh, and, uh, you know, it's very exciting to cell biologists like me to think about how microtubule dynamics is impacting proliferation. But it doesn't get past this fundamental problem that you're working with this really difficult compound that's extremely hydrophobic, present in very small amounts from just an, a painfully slow growing tree. And so to get around this or to try to improve the uh, production of Taxol, the NCI actually um, uh, partnered with Br Bristol Myers Squibb or, or permitted Bristol Myers Squibb to patent Taxol and commercialize it. And Bristol Myers Squibb developed a protocol for synthesizing Taxol. And that was really a breakthrough because now you could produce it in high quantities for use in the clinic. And so that happened pretty quickly over the course of the 90s. And by the year 2000, Taxol was a blockbuster chemotherapeutic drug. Uh, Bristol Myers Squibb in the year 2000 prof made a profit of like $1.4 billion off of Taxol. And it's still one of the most prevalently used and um, profitable chemotherapeutics that that's used to, uh, are used in the clinic. Okay, so Taxol has this interesting history of a naturally derived compound that in the yew tree is presumably used for the defense against, against pathogens, but in the clinic could be used to inhibit cancer cells. So despite the fact that it's been used for many years now, um, and it's still used prevalently in the treatment of many different cancers, we still don't have a deep understanding of how Taxol inhibits cancer cells, okay? So, so I'm gonna unpack that because we know a lot about how, how Taxol works, but there's still some really important gaps in knowledge 
um, that we're trying to address in, in, in my lab. So the basic observations that were made early on is that taxol blocks the proliferation of cells, and particularly at high doses of taxol, you block cells from um, undergoing cell division, okay? So in principle, taxol must be affecting the microtubules that are forming the mitotic spindle. But this has been rather controversial in the field because there are different levels of response depending on what cell type you're using and what concentration of taxol uh, you're treating cells with. So this is something that actually Lisa Wood, uh, a student in the cancer biology program, is focusing on for her thesis work, trying to understand in the context of, of certain types of cancer with clinically relevant doses of taxol, how does taxol actually inhibit the proliferation of cancer cells? Okay. I'll show a few of Lisa's experiments uh, here. So um, remember the, the, the current model or the prevalent model in the field is that taxol is an antimitotic, right? Taxol blo blocks cells from going through mitosis and successfully dividing. So Lisa tried this starting with uh, MB231 cells and found that when she treated with rather low doses of taxol, because Lisa's trying to recapitulate a similar concentration of taxol that patients see when they receive taxol as a chemotherapeutic, she found that actually the, the mitotic index um, of these 231 cells, the effect was rather minimal, right? So you had to really drive up the concentration of taxol to see, um, to see a big effect on mitotic index. So in the low nanomolar range, which is where we're really interested, uh, this effect is pretty modest, right? The other thing that you can probably see by looking at these um, microscopy images is that, you know, when you're looking for mitotic index, the, the really um, obvious image that you're looking for are cells that have condensed chromosomes that are aligned at the metaphase plate, right? So that's a really a key indicator, chromosome condensation and then alignment of, of mitosis. You don't really see that in the taxol treated image, right? You can see some images, uh, examples of condensed chromosomes, but they're not nicely aligned. And Lisa made the same observation and she went on to investigate the structure of the mitotic spindle in the, in the taxol treated cells. And what she's found is that taxol treatment at these low doses, although it doesn't have a huge impact on mitotic index, it strongly impacts the structure and organization of the mitotic spindle. Okay. So this is just an example of a 231 cell control cell with a nice aligned metaphase array of chromosomes, a bipolar spindle, which we can assess by two uh, concentrated foci of gamma tubulin, right, which is the nucleator of microtubules at those condensed poles of the spindle, alpha tubulin decorated microtubules that are emanating out, really similar to Fleming's drawing, right? Uh, but when you treat cells with low dose taxol, you really, you really screw up that structure, right? So you screw it up in multiple ways. This is first obvious from looking at the organization of the chromosomes. You don't get this nice alignment of chromosomes along the metaphase plate. You get, uh, in many cases, more than two clusters of gamma tubulin, indicating that you don't have a nice bipolar spindle. You've actually got potentially more than two poles. And that's consistent with the alpha tubulin staining too. So if you look at alpha tubulin, which is telling you where the microtubule filaments are, they're not, they don't look like Fleming's drawing, right? They're not emanating from two poles and reaching out. They're actually reaching out from more than two clusters, right? Jeff? Yeah. Can I, there is a question in the chat and I thought I would moderate. Oh, a little oh that'd bit. be great. Okay. Thank you. So Edward Evans is asking, um, considering the many roles of microtubules, is taxol selective in the microtubules that affect um, or involved in mitosis, similarly to those, say, involved in uh, migration? So, what are the alternative roles and yeah. where is taxol being affected? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something I was going to touch on later. So, um, certainly, taxol, well, I won't say certainly, in principle, taxol could impact those other microtubule dependent processes that I was talking about. In fact, this is a big concern in the clinic because one of the side effects of, of taxol that, that is a reason we keep doses low 
is that peripheral neuropathy um, um, is a real concern for patients that are receiving taxol treatment, right? So, so affecting the microtubule structures that are really important for the structure and function of neurons in the brain. Taxol doesn't pass the blood-brain barrier very efficiently, but at high doses, if enough of it gets into the brain, it can really affect um, neuronal function. So that that's one example. Um, but you know, I think this is this is a broad question that we're really interested in, and again, I'm going to touch on it in just a bit. So I'm, I'm focusing on spindles here, but it's really good that we're thinking about other, um, other microtubule roles. Okay, so, so as far as understanding how taxol impacts the mitotic spindle, you know, Lisa's observations have really um, helped us focus on a series of next questions, which are, you know, if, if the role of taxol is to stabilize microtubule polymers, how does the stabilization of microtubule polymers lead to multipolar spindles, right? How does it sort of violate that rule of two poles um, and drive cells to form spindles that have too many poles? And then what's the fate of these multipolar spindles? Do they eventually resolve? So is this image that we're capturing here some sort of intermediate or is that a terminal phenotype, right? Can cells pull these multipolar spindles together to go back into a bipolar-like spindle that's sufficient to complete mitosis? Um, or do they get stuck in this multipolar spindle state? Um, and then if they do pull these clusters together into a bipolar configuration, is that configuration now sufficient for um, high fidelity chromosome, chromosome segregation, right? Or if you build a spindle in the wrong way, do you now create an imbalance of forces to, to, pull, to pull chromosomes apparently? and missegregate them. So these are the sorts of questions that we're interested in answering next. Okay. But here's just a simple version of that model going back to the basic mechanism of our tubal dynamics. So if the basic mechanism is this cycle of polymerization, catastrophe, depolymerization, and then starting over again, Taxol really puts the brakes on this catastrophe step and in doing so locks more tubulin in the polymer and that's somehow connected to the formation of multipolar spindles. Okay, but we're really interested then in, in going beyond this very spindle-focused view of, of, of how taxol works to understand how is it that, that there are cells or different types of cancers that exhibit different levels of sensitivity to taxol. Okay, so this is sort of getting back to um, what I brought up earlier about migration and cilia and mitotic spindles. If you think about tubulin as a building block that cells use for many different functions, in principle, cells are, these different processes could all be um, sensitive to taxol in different levels, okay? But the other way of thinking about this is that there are components within these networks that might determine the sensitivity of these different microtubule dependent processes to taxol treatment. And one of the areas that we're focusing on in my lab is actually the tubulin building blocks themselves and testing the idea that in different cellular and developmental contexts, the tubulin building blocks are different, right? And cells have a different profile of tubulins that they express that are important for driving these different processes and could then determine the sensitivity to microtubule targeting agents like taxol, okay? So, one thing we've become very interested in since starting my lab is the, is the tubulin isotype. So tubulins are actually encoded by families of genes that are known as isotypes. So alpha tubulin and beta tubulin are each encoded by multiple genes in the human genome, okay? There are nine uh, alpha tubulin encoding genes and there are 10 beta tubulin encoding genes. This is a little fuzzy actually, because we don't have good uh, uh, information on the proteins that are encoded by all nine alphas and all 10 betas. But in principle, based on sequence, um, these all appear to encode tubulin, uh, bona fide tubulin genes. And I draw this distinction here because in addition to the nine alphas and 10 betas that appear to be functional tubulin encoding genes, there are also many, many pseudogenes, right? So there are 15 alpha tubulin pseudogenes in the human genome and 30 beta tubulin pseudogenes in the human genome. So I say pseudogenes because those tubulin encoding genes uh, have 
uh, um, nonsense uh, codons within the coding sequence that should prevent the expression of uh, a full tubulin protein, right? So exactly what, if any, role these pseudogenes play in microtubule function uh, is not understood at all, uh, nor do we really understand where and when they might be expressed in development. But really just kind of stepping back, this tells you that um, you know, comparing this really diverse palette of tubulin genes that are present in humans to really um, minimal um, repertoires of tubulins that are expressed in simple organisms, tubulin genes have just exploded in diversity in the human, human genome. And it seems like through many different gene duplication events, um, the, the genome sort of sampled different tubulin copy numbers um, maintained a large number of tubulin coding genes, but then apparently lost an, a larger number of them too. So the other interesting thing here that I want to point out is that, you know, this uh, diversity of alpha and beta tubulin encoding genes is not unique to, tubulin, to humans. If we go back through mammals and then through vertebrates, many of these are also conserved in um, these, higher order, these higher eukaryotes, right? suggesting that there is selective pressure to maintain some of these tubulin genes, right? So there's this apparent exploration of different tubulin gene copies, um, but also a, a, a strict conservation to maintain some of them. So this is a, is a roundabout way of, of me leading to this hypothesis that the different alpha and beta tubulin encoding genes could be important for imparting different properties to microtubule networks in a, in a cell and development specific manner. Consistent with that, we know that different tubulin isotypes are expressed differentially according to cell type and developmental stage. Okay, so this is the example of beta tubulin where I'm showing you the eight best characterized beta tubulin isotypes. So different types of tissues and cell types within them express blends of tubulin genes. So it's not the case that they express all one type of beta or you know, spleen express all another type of beta. Each tissue type and cell type is expressing some different blend of combinations of different beta tubulin genes. And, and this is also true for alpha. So this suggests at least that when cells uh, such as the brain have a requirement for different types of microtubule networks, they may fire different tubulin genes to supply the tubulin protein to build those networks, right? And so a hypothesis that we're really interested in the lab is whether tubulin isotypes really just provide a transcriptional platform that cells can use to meet different demands for tubulin proteins, or the different tubulin isotypes actually have functional differences. And so when you need to build microtubule networks within the brain, you may access different tubulin isotypes that have slightly different properties that are important for the formation and function of those networks. Okay, that's, that's a hypothesis that we're very interested in the lab. And actually, uh, a, a, one of the major efforts in the lab is to understand mutations that occur in specific isotypes and how those give rise to very specific um, human diseases, particularly um, brain malformations. But relevant to cancer, we know that tumor cells, in contrast to, to normal tissues, exhibit a barren expression of beta tubulin genes, right? So this is just looking at, at mRNA levels, comparing, in this case, normal lung tissue to tumors. And you can see that there are shifts in the relative abundance of different tubulin isotypes. So in general, it's rather well established that, that cancer cells exhibit different profiles or programs of tubulin gene expression, right? And they may be calling different developmental tubulin expression programs. One of the isotypes that we're really interested in is this beta-3 tubulin called TUB3. So I'll refer to it as, as beta-3 or TUB3 from now on. So TUB3 is really famous as a brain tubulin. And in fact, it's, it's, an, it's the... Um, antigen for the TUDGE1 antibody that is used to identify um, neurons in the developing brain. So that binds specifically to this beta-3 tubulin isotype. And if you look at this profile of mRNA expression, you see, as we'd expect, that, that 
beta-3 tubulin is highly expressed in the brain, but, but very little, if any, is found in most of the other tissues of your body. However, tumors, particularly breast tumors and lung tumors and, and um, ovarian tumors, often express high levels of beta-3. And when I say high levels, I don't mean that it's most of the tubulin that's expressed in the cell, but it can approach you know, between five and 10%. So again, it's not that different cell types or different cancers express all one isotype or all another isotype, but it's this shifting blend of, of isotypes. So that's, that's an observation of beta-3 um, expression differences in cancer. But also we know that there are many studies that correlate beta-3 expression levels with prognosis. And high beta-3 correlates with poor prognosis, with taxane resistance, and with uh, metastatic aggressive cancer, right? So this is all correlation though. So of the tubulin isotypes, beta-3 expression seems to be higher in, in many cases of aggressive um, metastatic cancer. So we're, we're really interested in, in why that is. So what's so special about the beta-3 isotype that it could explain um, those correlations? So we've, we're thinking about this on a fundamental level, and we're not the only lab working on this, but um, we're trying to understand whether beta-3 really impacts that basic mechanism of microtubule dynamics and whether that could explain or contribute to um, its impact on taxing resistance and metastasis in cancer. So uh, one of the big, uh, big developments in the microtubule field in the last uh, five to 10 years has been the ability to express and purify isotypes um, recombinantly. So, you know, in the, in the four decades of microtubule research um, prior, the major source of tubulin for doing these in vitro reconstitution experiments like this one that I showed you earlier was the slaughterhouse, right? So the brain is a, is a great source of tubulin. And so you can purify high amounts of tubulin protein um, from the brains of farm animals, basically. And you can use these to reconstitute these in vitro dynamics experiments, right? But brain tubulin, of course, is this blend of different isotypes and so it doesn't allow you access to, to understanding how do certain isotypes impact the activity of microtubules. So nowadays, you can purify um, specific isotypes through expression and purification from insect cells um, or from, from budding yeast, which is, which is one of the ways that we do it in the lab. And in doing that, you can compare the activity of different isotypes to test this hypothesis that tubule and isotypes impart different um, uh, functions to microtubule dynamics by altering the basic mechanism. So this was done recently for beta-3 by two labs, uh, Antonina roll misak at NIH and Tarun Kapoor at Rockefeller, where they compared tubulin heterodimers that were expressed recombinantly and purified. And those heterodimers either consisted of an alpha tubulin, um, which is tub A1b, complexed with beta-2b isotype, or complexed with beta-3, right? And what they found was that the, the heterodimers that had beta-2b exhibited similar polymerization rates to heterodimers that had beta-3, and mixing the two together, this is a half-and-half half mix of beta-2b and beta-3, didn't impact polymerization rate. But beta-3 had a strong effect on catastrophe. So if you compare the catastrophe frequency, and again, catastrophe is the transition from growing to shortening. If you compare transition, that transition rate in heterodimers that have beta 2b to heterodimers that have a higher and higher concentration of beta 3, you see that catastrophe frequency increases. So what that suggests is that in this normal mechanism of microtubule dynamics, Heterodimers that have beta-3 tubulin exhibit a fine polymerization rate, but once they're buried within the microtubule, oh, sorry, they promote this catastrophe step, all right? So the transition to shortening. So I think a way to think about this is that if this is a cycle that's running at a certain rate, 
increasing the levels of beta-3 makes this run faster because you're pushing the polymer into depolymerization, liberating more tubulin to, to replenish the pool for growth, right? So beta-3 tubulin is making this cycle run faster. Okay, so given that observation that beta-3 tubulin alters catastrophe frequency, does that lend some understanding to how it alters the activity of microtubule targeting agents, particularly taxol? So it turns out that the vast majority of microtubule targeting agents that we know now bind to beta tubulin and alter its activity, right? The taxane site is, is located here, which is sort of hard to interpret. But if you think about this in the context of a polymer, right? If, if my arm here is a growing protofilament and then there's a growing protofilament next to it, when those zipper up, they're using these flexible loops that reach across the interface and, and tie them together, right? Those flexible loops are known as the M loop coming from one side and the H1S2 loop from the other side. So beta-3 is an interesting isotype because although most of the human beta tubulins are highly conserved in this H1S2 loop region, Beta tubulin three or beta three has three interesting substitutions. So one of the things that we're really interested in the lab is trying to understand whether these apparently subtle substitutions at this really critical interface are important for altering beta tubulin's effect or beta three's effect on microtubule dynamics and perhaps sensitivity to um, microtubule stabilizing agents. Okay, and I put this here just to remind me that. Um, this interface here that's formed between the M loop and the H1S2 loop is really important for zippering up protofilaments next to each other. It's also where taxol and other stabilizers like apophilone A bind. So they bind right here at the base of the M loop and are thought to keep the M loop in an extended conformation to help maintain that lateral interface and prevent protofilaments from peeling out and releasing tubulin subunits, okay? So importantly, Epothalone and taxol both bind next to the M loop, but the substitutions that we're interested in in beta-3 are on the other side of the interface in the H1S2 loop. So we're really interested in understanding whether these differences in beta-3 <clears throat> could alter interactions across the interface <clears throat> and promote microtubule catastrophe and resistance to taxol. It's a tough problem to solve, right? Because as I said, in, in cells in vivo or in or in vitro, uh, cells express blends of isotypes. And so it's really hard to identify the impact of changes in just one isotype. So to do that, you've really got to move to some pure isotype um, system, which you can do in vitro through purification. Or for our purposes, we're trying to model beta-3 in budding yeast. So the example of or, or the advantage of modeling beta-3 in budding yeast is that in contrast to humans, which express this wide variety of beta tubulins, budding yeast express just one beta tubulin, and it's called tub2. Okay. So tub2 at the sequence level is about 85% homologous to human beta tubulins. Um, but it's the only beta tubulin in budding yeast, which means that we can take advantage of genome, genome editing in budding yeast to go in and edit the beta tubulin <clears throat> to make it mimic sequence differences that are present in beta three or other human tubulins, excuse me, and use that to test whether it modulates sensitivity to microtubule um, targeting agents. <clears throat> so the experimental design is, is pretty simple. So we use budding yeast to generate uh, isotype mimicking mutants. In this case, we're gonna focus on that H1S2 loop of beta-3, and then we're going to test the different yeast mutants that we create for altered drug sensitivity. And then we can actually use cell biology to measure where the effects are, are, are direct or indirect. That is, do they impact the actual microtubule dynamics mechanism in cells? Okay, so this is what our, what our experimental design uh, looks like. So we have a, a very simple assay for measuring the fitness of budding yeast cells, and that, that's simply measuring their growth in liquid culture, right? So we can do this in a, in a large format um, and generate these, uh, um, uh, sorry, quantitative growth curves and do that for either wild type cells that express wild type um, tub two from budding yeast, 
or TUB2, where we've introduced three different substitution mutations to mimic the substitutions that are found at the beta-3 H1S2 loop. So in under control conditions with just DMSO, we see that there's, there's no strong difference in the rate of proliferation or the doubling time of the cells. But when we add stabilizing drugs, we see that that slows the proliferation of wild type cells, but it slows, but has less of an impact on the beta three mimic. And the, and the data in this example looks something like this. So in this case, we're not using Taxol, we're using a different um, stabilizing agent known as apothalone A, which binds to a similar site on beta tubulin. And what we can see is that wild type yeast exhibit this sensitivity to concentrations of apothalone A. We're increasing the concentration, results in a longer doubling time, so slower proliferation. It takes the cells longer to go through mitosis and double and move on to the next generation. But if we make those three substitutions, at the H1S2 loop to mimic beta-3, that's sufficient to confer uh, uh, resistance to apothalone A, okay? The cells grow better in higher concentrations of apothalone A. We know that this is um, related to effects on microtubule dynamics because we can go into the same cells and measure the dynamics of microtubules that have been treated with apothalone A. So in wild-type yeast, we can express um, GFP fused to alpha tubulin and use that to label the microtubules of the mitotic spindle, as well as dynamic astral microtubules. And you can see these playing in a movie here that grow and shrink, and we can measure these over time um, in confocal microscopy images. When we take the same cells and treat them with apothalone A, you'll see the astral microtubules here don't really change in length, right? So apothalone A is, is stabilizing tubulin in the polymer form. However, when we make that triple mutant in the H1S2 loop to mimic beta-3, we find that, I'm just gonna jump down to this movie here, that these microtubules are still dynamics. They're not as dynamic as the DMSO-treated controls, but they maintain the ability to grow, catastrophe, shrink, and then start all over again, even in the presence of apothalone A. So that's nice evidence that these changes in the H1S2 loop that are uniquely found in beta-3 tubulin are su sufficient to provide resistance to the action of microtubule stabilizing drugs. So as a next step, we want to understand whether, um, whether what we've seen here for apothalone A, which was our first drug of choice, um, is also true for Taxol. And then we want to take this back to beta-3 itself and ask whether those, um, those unique amino acid residues that are found in beta-3 are actually necessary for resistance to um, microtubule targeting agents and the effect on catastrophe. So to, to put these two together, to put these two parts together, I told you that um, in the normal cycle of microtubule dynamics, Taxol is a really potent uh, microtubule targeting agent because it has this ability to block catastrophe and lock tubulin in the polymer form. One of the tubulin isotypes, one of the beta tubulin isotypes, beta-3, appears to allow microtubules to escape the activity of taxol, or at least provide some resistance to taxol, by driving more frequent catastrophes, right? This is an intrinsic activity of beta-3 tubulin. And so the idea here is that beta-3 is pushing more tubulin through this cycle faster, and that diminishes the activity of taxol. So it's not directly impacting the binding of taxol, but it's diminishing its effect on the ability of Taxol to hold the polymer together. Okay, so today I've told you about how, um, how naturally derived microtubule targeting agents are important for understanding the basic mechanism of microtubule dynamics, how they have really strong effects on the ability of cells to use microtubules to form mitotic spindles, and how they're used um, effectively to treat cancer in, um, in the clinic. And going forward, we wanna use our investigation of beta-3 and the mechanism of taxol action to understand how to really identify better indicators of uh, uh, taxol treatment, of the success of taxol treatment, as well as understand mechanisms of taxol resistance. But you know, related to this, the last thing that I wanted to mention is, you know, we're kind of taking a taking a uh, inspiration from um, Barclay and that that uh, 
NCI USDA collaboration that happened many years ago to try to use um, nature to understand uh, modifications to this basic mechanism of microtubal dynamics in order to gain greater insight. And so one of the things that um, we're doing in the lab right now is looking at another potent um, effector of, of microtubal dynamics, and that is temperature. So we've known for a long, long time that microtubules are exquisitely cold sensitive. That is, if you take uh, human cells and shift them to low temperatures for just a few minutes, you rapidly depolymerize microtubules, right? So, so that tubule in equilibrium is very sensitive to temperature. And as temperature drops, you push all the tubule into, the, into solution, right? It falls out of um, the polymer form and it, it has trouble re-entering the polymer form. So we're trying to take advantage of that as a particular stress to understand um, how differences in tubule and isotypes impact the basic mechanism of dynamics. And in this project, which is a project that was run by Gabby Lee, who was a former um, graduate student who just started a postdoc at, at NREL, Gabby was interested in if, if microtubules in human cells are so exquisitely cold sensitive and microtubules are conserved across um, eukaryotic evolution, how is it that there are organisms that live uh, at very low temperatures that are still able to make mitotic spindles, to undergo cell migration, to form neurons, and all the other things that we think about microtubules being required for. So I don't have time to get into it today, but I'd be happy to, to, to tell you more about it. But Gabby basically used a, a genetic approach to understand the isotypes that are present in cold adapted organisms, where the sequence differences are in those tubulins, and how those sequence differences impact microtubule dynamics, drug sensitivity, and mitotic spindle form and function. Okay, so with that, I wanna thank uh, our funding sources. So a lot of what I told you about today was actually funded by an NSF career grant um, that we have in the lab that's funding Gabby Lee's project as well as uh, Lisa Wood's project. So Lisa did all of the work on beta three and taxol that I showed. We're also supported by an R35 from NIGMS um, that funds a lot of our work on tubulin isotypes and the mitotic spindle. Uh, this is this is the lab circa 2019 and 2020. Once we can uh, get together uh, and, and pull our masks down to smile, we'll take a new lab photo. Um, with that, I would love to answer any questions that you all have. Thanks. Great. That was fun, Jeff. Um, so just quickly, let me get uh, started. So Mike Klimkowski has a good point about you know, just wanting to know what are the off target or not necessarily off target, but what are the other binding proteins that Taxol is binding to and what is known about that? Yeah, that, that's, not, that's not very well understood, actually. I think that's a really great question. So um, one of the reasons actually that I showed you data for our experiments in, in budding yeast where we're looking at apothalone resistance is that apothalone very effectively binds to yeast tubulin and, and um, stabilizes it and disrupts yeast cell division. The reason that we didn't do our first experiments with Taxol is that Taxol actually doesn't bind with high affinity to yeast tubulin and, and doesn't stabilize yeast microtubules. However, one of the observations that we've made in trying to um, modify our experiments to start to test Taxol and yeast is that even though it doesn't bind and stabilize microtubules very effectively, Taxol still inhibits uh, proliferation of yeast, right? Hinting that there are non-tubulin binding partners for Taxol that could be relevant here. So I think this is a great question. I don't, I don't have a handle on what those are though. Um, but actually that, that, that's a case where we could sort of use our, our yeast clean slate system to identify um, who those may be. Great. And then, uh, James, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Uh, great talk, Jeff. So first, this is a compound question. So first, do you, is it known how the yew tree, that, or does it, does it have resistance to taxol in the beginning? And if it does, is that similar to the mechanism that maybe cancer cells develop following treatment? And could that evolve, you know, either mutation or a sort of isoform switching, uh, like going to more tub three? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So, so taxol is only found in the bark of the yew tree, 
And I, you know, I don't know what the, what the tissue specific, what, what the isotypes of beta tubulin are in the yew tree and what tissues they may be expressed in the different levels. I think that's, that's what you'd want to know to yeah. test that idea. Right. So, so one thing that, um, one thing is I, I suspect that there could be differences there. And, and part of the reason that I suspect that is I didn't have time to get into it, but some of our, our investigation of cold adaptation, you know, cold adaptation also really slows down the mechanism of dynamics in interesting ways. And one of the things that Gabby found was that some of the substitutions, even single amino acid substitutions from things like fish that swim the Southern Ocean and, and worms that live in glacial ice are sufficient to drive the mechanism or drive that mechanism faster and make those microtubules resistant to stabilizing drugs. So I do suspect that, that the yew tree would have other isotypes with you know, substitutions in these particular regions between the protofilaments that might confer similar properties. But what about with cancer cells? I mean, when someone gets treated with taxols and their cancer relapses, is there intrinsic taxol resistance? Or is it just through like multi-drug resistance where it's just pumping it out or something like that? And was, is the resistance mechanism related directly to the microtubules? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, so uh, the, the answer is it's complicated, right? So I think there, there's great evidence that there are multi-drug resistant phenotypes, mm -hmm. right? That are found in patients that, that develop can, uh, taxol resistance. But there are also examples of, of um, uh, non-multi-drug resistant phenotypes that are correlated with higher levels of beta-3, right? So that, that's part of our motivation for being interested in beta-3 mm -hmm. is that beta-3 levels do show correlation in some cases with taxol resistance. There's also evidence of tubular mutations that are associated with um, uh, with taxol resistance. So that's something that we're also very interested in. Cool, great, thanks. All right, and then I think, um, let's see. So there's one, a uh, couple questions from Steve Nordine that I think are interesting. So tub six has substitutions from consensus in the same three key residues as tub three. Does it have similar effects? on tub three with respect to drug resistance or does it have the same effects as dr on drug resistance? Yeah, yeah, tub, tub six is a really interesting one. Um, we, we don't know yet. Uh, we haven't tested uh, tub six mimics. Um, the expression profile of, of tub six is, is different and it's not as strongly correlated with taxol resistance, but um, you know, the, the shorter answer is we're really interested in identifying let me rephrase this. Tubulin is so well conserved across these isotypes that the differences are few enough that we can realistically model many different ones to establish these sort of activity profiles for different isotypes, including um, their sensitivity to different microtubule stabilizing drugs. So, so we don't know yet, but that's something that we're really interested in. And then I think going back to the prior discussion, Jennifer has a few really important comments um, just in terms of, um, uh, uh, I think that the taxol does bind specifically to tubulin since you just decrease tub three levels by restoration of mirror 200 C, um, you can make um, resistance cells sensitive. You're reading this at the same time. So is yeah, that- yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so for sure, don't, sorry, I didn't want to get the wrong impression. Taxol for sure binds to tubulin, right? It clearly binds to tubulin and there are clearly, um, you know, isotype dependent or other mutations that you can make to tubulin that, that ablate that binding and provide resistance. But I think it's, it's interesting to speculate that there may be other t uh, taxol binding proteins in the cell. And some of our experiments from yeast and some other evidence suggest that there may be, whether those are like the, the principal binding site or our binding partner for taxol, um, probably not, it's probably tubular. Okay, and I'll just finish on one kind of fun one, also back to Steve's comments, um, you know, and this is about mammalian hibernators that live at both high and low temperatures, are microtubule depolymerized at low temperatures when cell division is going on in those, or does cell division I think would be another question that, that is important there in the hibernation state. Oh man, that, okay, yeah, this is great. This gets, gets into something that we're, <laughs> we're really interested in. We, 
we used to talk to Sandy a lot about uh, Sandy Martin a lot about this. So, um, so uh, hibernators have a really interesting microtubule response to low temperatures. Um, so there's been really nice work actually on um, IPSC derived neurons from from IPSC lines that were actually derived from 13 line ground squirrels. So these these um, hibernator ground squirrels. And so they actually, um, in, in contrast to, uh, you know, sort of normal homeotherm mammal neurons, which lose their microtubules during cold shock, the IPSC neurons retain microtubules during cold shock. So clearly they have unique ability to stabilize their microtubules and resist um, cold stimulated depolymerization. How that happens is not clear at all at the sequence level, because this is one of the first things that we did when we started talking to Sandy about this. At the sequence level, the, the isotypes that are present in organisms like 13 line ground squirrels are not obviously different. They're not different in these, these interfaces that we've been focusing on with beta-3. However, um, from Sandy's data, there's clearly differences in expression of microtubule regulators like Staffman um, that, may, that may suggest that um, there's a different profile or response in the expression of the proteins that regulate that mechanism of dynamics that are keeping microtubules stable so that you know, you're not retracting all of your processes during um, low temperature and then having to re-extend them and, and build networks. Um, so there, there are different ways of adapting to life at low temperatures. They don't all involve differences in the tubulin proteins, um, but they may be connected to this cycle of, of microtubule dynamics. Great. Yeah, I love that stuff. Well, thank you for a fantastic talk, Jeff. And uh, we'll, we'll stop it there at, at, at seven after. And thank you all for, for coming. All right. Take care. Thanks all. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. Yeah, you bet. Hey, Jill, should I hang on in here for a while or? Um, I think that would be fine. I do. Okay. Just in case anybody wants to talk to you. Um, yeah. I should have said something in the beginning, but. No, it's okay. And anybody that's in here, if you want to talk about tubulin, let's, let's go. That'd be great. Okay.